joining us right here from NFL Live. I also enjoy listening to him call games uh, on uh, the college football weekend. Our friend Dan Orlovsky from ESPN back here on the show. How are you, Dan? I'm doing good, Rich. Good back. Good to be back with you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, I'm 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 just got a ton of questions for you. I'm just going to jump right into it. What do you see when you look at the Chiefs? What's going on? Do you think when you see them? A lot of issues. Um, what are a they? A lot of issues. Number one, there's there's a lack of commitment to running the football. We all know that. Um, do I think they're great at it? No, but the lack of commitment to actually calling runs. This is a an offense that has made its foundation, the RPO, the run-pass option. When you do that, there are negative consequences to that for both units and players. Your offensive line does not fire off the football um, like it would if a run, just a run play was called. They no longer are obsessed with moving people off the line of scrimmage. Candidly, they can't really try to drive people past three or four yards because if Patrick pulls the ball on the RPO and throws it, that's going to be a flag. So I think there's been a slow deterioration in the mindset of an offensive lineman. Um, I think number two, Patrick Mahomes' feet have absolutely no rhythm to that. Um, I'm doing this on NFL Live today, a breakdown. Yep. I think Patrick Mahomes mechanically right now is the worst quarterback in the NFL. Um, let, let me, let me, I'm not trying to be a hot take or hyperbolic here. I'm completely aware of who I was as a player, and I'm completely aware of who Patrick is. Um, Patrick's the most talented player I've ever seen at that position in my life. I also want to, don't want to pretend like Patrick was Drew Brees, like he was this tactician, this technically, you know, um, perfect player. He's always been a poor mechanic or freelance mechanic player. He has never been who he is right now inside the pocket. His feet mechanically are so bad right now. It is having such a negative impact on the pocket presence, the accuracy, the rhythm of a play. Um, There's multiple examples last night, and it has slowly started to present itself and deteriorate, and I thought last night was even more of a culmination. There are still moments of good results, yet there's a bad process when it comes to that. Mm. Um, You know, they haven't really developed the number two wide receiver outside of Tyreek. Tyreek, Kelsey's the tight end. That's one and two pass catchers, but there's no number two wide out. Um, So, you know, it's not just a single thing, Rich. Um, Do I think there's fixable aspects to it? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I think that Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy, Mike Kafka, and Patrick Mahomes have earned the right for patience, so to speak, and belief and trust in it. But that's just the reality right now. That was my follow-up about how fixable things are because, you know, obviously it is the longest regular season ever. We keep hearing that. We're now have, have reaching right around the halfway point. There is an extra game of runway. Uh, unfortunately, that extra game of runway for Patrick Mahomes, that 17th game is coming up this week. It's Green Bay. So you run out of time for patience and trying to fix stuff that is fixable. How quickly is this stuff fixable in your estimation? Yeah, I, I don't think the mechanical stuff is fixable in season. I think that's really difficult. Can you make it better? Yes. Do mm. I think you can get rid of it? No. I mean, that is a, that is a commitment to the offseason type of thing for me. Um, but I think they can get him better on it as, as long as they emphasize it and he emphasizes it and really works at it. The reality is, you only practice three days a week, right? And so maybe it's one of those things, and this is what I would be trying to sit down and have a conversation. we got to sit and we got to come in on Monday and Tuesday and work on some of this stuff. Give me 30 minutes. Give me an hour. Mm-hmm. I, I just, for me, that's what I would try to be talking about. Um, I've been pounding the table that, you know, I would call more check with me's more than RPOs. Check with me's are you call two plays in the huddle. One could be a run, one could be a pass. You want to get to the line of scrimmage and they're going to play you in those two high safeties? Let's run it. The offensive line, we are not throwing it until you hear me go check, check, alert, alert, apple, apple, whatever. That is the check with me. And if they drop down a safety and play one high, well, then we could throw the football. And I think it's, that would be a benefit for their offense. Um, the turnovers and penalties are with, I don't think we're, they, that's who they are this year right now. That's just who they are. And they're going to have to try to overcome that. And, and kind of really hone in on some of the other execution aspects to, to kind of mask it, so to speak. Dan Orlovsky here on the Rich Eisen Show. You could check out more of Dan's opinions of 
Patrick Mahomes' footwork and what's fixable and what's not later on NFL Live on ESPN. He's on the Rich Eisen Show right here. What do you think's going through Sean Payton's mind uh, about who's the starter, uh, not just for this week, with it looks like um, Taysom Hill on course to return from a concussion, uh, or for, for the rest of a season that appears to be flat out in the mix for the division and for a run in the NFC. I mean, the Saints are coming on strong. This is a season that is not lost. What do you have for me on this, Dan? What do you think? Yes, yeah, Sean Payton's track record and, and the empirical data we have on Sean Payton says that he's going to be pretty darn good and so will the Saints no matter who his quarterback is. Hmm. Um, you know, he's got 20, we got 20 games of Sean Payton as the head coach of the Saints without Drew Brees. He's in 19 games, excuse me. He's 16 and six without Drew. Okay, so Drew's a Hall of Famer. You're not going to get that production out of the quarterback. But this, the backbone of this football team, roster-wise, is a hands-on, sticky defense. It sure is. That is not changing. And then a very good offensive line. So I look at it as saying, Trevor Simeon. If we were going to point to one thing that he could not do, that is his fatal flaw, so to speak. It is having to move, having to go above the X's and O's, having to go create. Well, with a dominant offensive line, or a really good offensive line, and a lights-out play caller, you don't really need that as a quarterback. I need you, and Sean Payton needs Trevor Simeon to go and be really good with his decision-making, get the football to Alvin Kamara and Michael Thomas, who's coming back, Marquez Callaway, who's coming on, I think they move forward with Trevor Simeon because of that, because of the offensive line and because of Sean Payton. And I still think that they can be a good football team. I don't think that this is a Super Bowl run football team. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, I don't believe that adding Drew Brees back or Phillip Rivers or Cam Newton or trading for Nick Foles changes that. I think this is a team that can be a good football team and be in the mix come December with Trevor Simeon because of the backbone being the defense and the offensive line. Can you do me a favor and put into words best you can from your experience uh, with what Simeon was able to do in the middle of a game, Mike White getting a start um, for the first time in his career, um, also Cooper Rush not knowing really if he's going to start until the last minute and then he wins his first career start. How difficult is that to do, Dan? Yeah, yeah it's there's – certain aspects of it that are incredibly challenging because you're waiting for the moment. You don't know when it's going to come. Specifically for a guy like Cooper Rush and Mike White, those those later round draft picks, guys that have been tossed around or undrafted for agents, you know, Greg Olson, who's the offensive coordinator for the Las Vegas Raiders, was my rookie year quarterback coach. Mm -hmm. And he said something to me my rookie year that forever changed my football time, but also like my life, so to speak. And you don't know when the opportunity is going to come don't look back and regret that you weren't ready. And I think that's what we saw with some of those players is you don't know when the opportunity is going to present itself. And so you got to be impatiently patient. You have to maniacally work and prepare like it is going to be today and believe it's going to come because when it does, you get one shot as one of those late round guys. You get one moment to go, all right, this guy doesn't stink and we'll give him another chance. And you've just got to be so ready and prepared for it. And I think what you saw specifically with Mike White and Cooper Rush was those guys have sat and watched and sat and, and learned and had mental rep after mental rep after mental rep for thousands of mental reps. And so when they had to go on the field and play, they knew what to do with the football for the most part. I thought that both their mindsets were, I'm not going to lose the game. You know, and I've heard Steve Young say that so many times as a backup quarterback, don't lose the game. Mike White, go watch the tape. He just did a really good job of taking easy throws. He threw to the backs 20 times. Just, hey, you guys, go earn your scholarship. Go earn your paycheck, so to speak. Cooper Rush, you know, again, didn't do anything to hurt the football team outside of that one interception. And even then, the deep – so I just think those guys, you know, were ready for the moment, did not try to be something that they're not. And we're just very good with making sure that they did the simple things at a high level. I saw it my own two eyes at SoFi this weekend where the, the, the Patriots were daring, daring Justin Herbert to check it down, right? They were like, go ahead. You know, yep. like, this is what we, we're, we're, we're not going to let you go deep. Mike Williams is not going to beat us. 
you know, you need to be patient. And and the, the, the quarterback who did that and then took his shot, waited for guys to come clear on the second level, was Mac Jones. He was spectacular, Dan. He was yeah, yeah. spectacular again. It's Rich, unreal what's Rich, happening. Yeah. Him. Rich, I think Mac Jones is the best quarterback rookie-wise I've ever seen hmm. when it comes to knowing where to throw the football, when to throw the football, and how to throw the football. He just – I've said, I said this when I started looking at him. I called his game last year. He just has this incredible ability to play so fast. And – I think for many reasons why is because he was the scout team quarterback at Alabama playing against that Alabama defense for two years. You better learn to play real fast when you're playing against the starting defense for Alabama. There's two plays in the second half that are the phenomenal imagery of this. One is he does a play-action pass. It's to Jacoby Myers. Myers starts on the right side of the formation, and he's got like this little six- or seven-yard shallow cross to the left side. And it's a play action. It's in the fourth quarter on really that game ceiling drive, so to speak. And he ends up being basically wide open after the play action. And Mac just kind of floats this ball out there. It becomes this 20-yard completion. Go rewatch it because Mac comes out of the fake, flips his head around, and he puts his right foot, back foot in the ground. Right when that right foot hits the ground, that ball comes out of his hands, floated to space on the shallow cross. If he waits, two-tenths of a second, takes a fraction of a hitch or just a, a, a blink slower, he's going to get hit from his left side, the backside defensive end. It is going to be a sack fumble, and there's three chargers there waiting to pick up that fumble. That is something that it doesn't show up in a box score, but is a game-changing play. And it's because the young man knows when to throw the ball, mm-hmm. where to throw it, and how to throw it at such an incredibly high and efficient level right now that their offense doesn't really have moments of, um, you know, sputtering. They're they don't, just really, really efficient right now. He takes what he, he – ta- and then he has no problem throwing it away. I, I, I was really impressed with what I saw. Uh, yep. Last one for you, Dan, in the couple minutes I have left with you, Dan Orlovsky of ESPN. Uh, how impactful is the Von Miller acquisition? What, because obviously this is the Rams saying we need, we're going to win now. They, he's not under contract for next year. This is the ultimate, the ultimate uh, admission. Even though we've gotten the sense of it with the, everything else that they've done, this is it right now. They got they got the quarterback. They've got the back end. They got the front end. They got Bobby Trees. They got Cooper Cup. They've got Daryl Henderson. They got that line. They're ready. How impactful yeah. is Von Miller in your estimation? It's huge. Uh, the way I phrase it is this is about getting through the playoffs, not getting to the playoffs for the Los Angeles Rams. This is that four- or five-game stretch because they know who they got to play. When they get to the dance, they're playing the Dallas Cowboys and they're playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and they're playing the Green Bay Packers and they're playing the Arizona Cardinals. You better be able to get after the quarterback and not kind of succumb numbers on your back end. You better be able to bring four or five and still be playing coverage. Now, something the Rams have started to do that they did a little bit last year midway through the season they're taking Aaron Donald and Leonard Floyd and putting both those guys right next to each other, basically on a tackle outside of one of the offensive tackles. Aaron Donald head up and then Leonard Floyd outside of him. And then they're putting a, a, a different defensive lineman on the center's head, right above the center space, right? When Rich is an offense, when those guys do that and I got Donald and Floyd on one side and I got to throw the football Crazy. and they got a person over the center's head, I've got to take four people and send them that way. I have to because Leonard and Aaron are all the way outside, and i got to help the center. Von Miller is going to be away from that. <laughs> i got to bring four. I only got five. That means Von Miller is going to be one-on-one a lot. And I don't need Von to win like he did in 2015 30 times a game. I need him to win five times in those passing situations. And I think that's exactly what they're playing with Von Miller is. Wow, man. That's the only thing I could say. Is I'm, like, laughing listening to you say that. That is really yeah. wild. Yeah. That's how impactful. Uh, hey, man, thanks for the time. Greatly appreciate it. What game are you doing this weekend? What are you doing I this weekend? I have week? Oklahoma State and West Virginia. 7-1 and one Oklahoma State. They're a good football team, so I'm excited for it. All right, you're calling McAfee to do your research? Is that what you got? Is that what you're going to uh, do? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually demanding that McAfee join in the booth. I think it's going to be a hard no, but we'll see. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Really appreciate it. Let's do it again. Thanks, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're the best. Dan Orlovsky makes me smarter.
Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.